just living in the most amazing moment. Yeah. I'm so glad that in the context of eternity, time is redefined. We find ourselves in the immediate, the parousia, the immediate presence of the eternal one. And when someone steps out of this earth suit, they do not step into redefined time, but into eternity himself, who already dwells within them. So it's such, such, such a significant moment for Lydia and I to end our whirlwind tour to the United States, the first one in eight years. It started on the 2nd of December at Malcolm Smith's 70th year of celebration of his ministry. He started preaching three years before I was born. He's 84 now. And, and then it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit just set up a tour. And, and I remember the first day that we learned we were actually just going to be a presence on video at Malcolm's ministry. And then it was six months ago we were invited. And, and we weren't going to go be there because we have stopped our travels in 2015 to focus our time on, on treasure hunting the word, so that we could present page after page after page, not a few cherry-picking scriptures, <laughs> the conversation that was from before time was, the romance of the ages, the love letter of God to us. And so we've, we've stopped our traveling and <laughs> we've been more busy than ever in our lives because we, you, you, forget, you forget, is it Friday today? Is it, is it Sunday today? Because we live in a very remote part of the world. and We feel so privileged to participate in a word that ignites hearts far beyond the reach of our physical location. I remember way back, I think it was, yeah, it was in the 80s when we had the Axe teams I was prompted to do a translation of most of, or not, you know, some of Paul's epistles. I didn't get much further than, it was called the Ruach translation, but we never published it. Yeah. Someone last night said they still have a few copies of, of the old Ruach translation. Yeah. And I never, the last verse that I did, I don't think that was in the Ruach. I was busy with Philippians. That was to be the next book added. And I got to Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. And at that time, the ministry impact has grown significantly, and we had many pastors wanting us to, to, to start the organization and, and, and be a covering to the church. And I just began to sense in my heart for ourselves that um, it was just a new chapter. And, and I, was, I was reading, I was translating Philippians 2.12, where Paul says, not only in my presence, but much more. In my absence. I should read it in the mirror now. Maybe it's here. I just want to read this to you. Could you do this at home? Because I'm just going to read the one verse. But please do read Philippians chapter 2. Verse 8. I'll just read verse 12. Because this 
We must know that Paul did not write in verses or chapters. We added those, and it's wonderful. It helps us, you know, just know where we are when we open the book. But this is such an amazing conversation. The book of Philippians, I think, is also a little audio book. But um, I'll just read from verse 8. And so we have the drama of the cross in context. Isn't it amazing to discover the context of the cross? I remember in 1997, 1998, I was freshly drawn out of the, the seven-year study program of the, of the denomination after our first three years. And they called me in, and my final exam, and said, um, they, a few professors said, look, we, um, we don't really see a future for you in, in, this, in this context. And I was so relieved, because <laughs> I didn't even... <laughs> So my, fa my father bought me a new Bible for Christmas with a set of rotring pen pens. It was German pens. You could really do fine writing with it, and it's a wide margin. And I remember the 1st of January, 1978. I opened that Genesis chapter 1, doing two chapters, new, new, Old Testament, then two in the, in the new. That's working through the old in one year and three times a year, and... I'll never forget the freshness of January 1, 1978. This excitement that it's a... I love Bibles, you know. I just love the smell of it and the look at it. But I'm into Genesis chapter 1. And I got to verse 26 and I started weeping. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And for the first time, I understood the context of the cross. And for the first time, I studied the Bible in the light of the success of the cross. And it became a new book to me in realizing that page after page, the prophetic word, the conclusion of time points to the significance of the cross. So I'm just going back to Philippians 2, verse, verse 8. And so we have the drama of the cross in context. The man, Jesus Christ, who is fully God, becomes fully man to, extent, to the extent of willingly, willingly dying humanity's death at the hands of his own creation. He embraced the curse and shame of the lowest kind in dying a criminal's death. From this place of utter humiliation, God exalted him to the highest rank. God graced Jesus with a name that is far above every other name. You know, sometimes one thinks, you know, like in the Olympics, you, you get the gold medal and you could just be a split second ahead of the, of the silver and the bronze. Just a split, just a fraction. It almost looks like all three. And sometimes we have this in our minds that, you know, Jesus beat the devil, you know, and, and, and it was just like marginally because it's as it is, you know, we kind of feel that, wow, the devil's got hand, his hand on most of the human race until we see a gospel that puts the devil out of business. That cancels any claim that any form or definition of darkness could have ever had on the human race. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And swearing by himself, God says not to persuade him, but to persuade us. All the earth shall be flooded with the knowledge of my glory as the waters cover the sea. All flesh shall see it together. The what? The glory of the Lord. And where is the glory of the Lord in hiding? In flesh. Because with open face, with unveiled eyes, we see the glory of the Lord. But this time as in a mirror. The glory of the Lord cannot get any closer than what it does at ease. Covered in skin, in flesh, the tabernacle of the Lord. So we have the drama of the cross in context. Verse 10. What his name unveils will persuade every creature of their redemption. 
every knee in heaven and upon the earth and under the earth shall bow in spontaneous worship. And this was just Paul quoting Isaiah 50, 45 verse 23. My own life is the guarantee of my conviction, says the Lord. Every knee shall freely bow to me in worship. And every tongue shall spontaneously speak from the same God-inspired source. Also, every tongue will voice and resonate the same devotion to his unquestionable lordship as the redeemer of life. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy Oh, thank you for the rest of the verse. John, John 10 verse 4, isn't it? But I have come that you might have life more abundantly. So which one outweighs the other? But I have come. <laughs> and we've preached to defeat the devil back into business. When he was already marched, marched through the streets, naked. And he led us as his trophies in his triumphant procession on high. Us who? Us human race. Blindfold mode has no future. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Back in the days, remember the cities would have a big wall around it. And there would be gates in the city. Which should be the most strategic point in that entire city? It's gates. Any, anyone would know if the gates can be taken, the city is yours. And in the context of Jesus saying this, Simon, son of Jonah, has freshly discovered that he was saying something most profound that he did not learn from someone. Jesus asked the most important question in the Bible. He says, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they had their ideas because suddenly the carpenter's son emerges on the scene in the most dramatic fashion. And they say, well, some say that there must be some link with with Elijah, maybe even the reincarnate Elijah. He says, but who do you say? And Simon says, he hears himself saying it. He says, Jesus. Remember what the question was? Who is the son of man? Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're what the book's all about. And Jesus in high five, Simon says, sit down, Simon. That's a good answer. He embraced Simon, and I can hear him say in the paraphrased paraphr version, Simon, now, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood had not revealed this to you. Now that you know who I am, allow me to introduce you to you. Mr. Rock, you're a chip of the old block. Petros, Petra is the old block. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, the quarry from which you were dug. Ascribe greatness to our God there. Rock. His work is perfect. Daniel sees a little stone cut out by no human hand. And a stone is on a mission. <laughs> Mr. Rock, you're a chip of the old block. There's nothing in the old block that is not equally present in you. Every attribute of God. Every attribute that image and likeness cover is already present in the human race. Blindfold mode, a fallen mindset. That, uh, uh, I did a chapter at the beginning of Luke chapter 4. I call it the wilderness of a lost identity. Identity redeemed is what the gospel is all about. Innocence redeemed is what the gospel is all about. Royalty redeemed is what the gospel is. The line of Judah, worthy to break the seals. And I looked, says John, and I saw a little lamb as if butchered, standing. You can only see the lion once you've seen the lamb. Having made 
purification for sins. He sat down and throned on our innocence. No wonder his name will persuade every creature of their redemption. Jeshua. The rescuer. Also, every tongue will voice and resonate the same devotion to his unquestionable lordship as the redeemer of life. Christ is glorified, has glorified God as the father of creation. This is the ultimate conclusion of the father's intent. Now I get to verse 12, the one I just wanted to read from the mirror. Considering this amazing outcome of what our faith sees and celebrates, I strongly urge you, my darling friends, to continue to have your ears tuned to that which inspires your conduct, to give full expression to the detail of your own salvation in a most personal and practical way. See salvation in its earth-shattering, awesome, and ultimate Conclusion, I know that my personal presence encourages you greatly, encourages you greatly. But now I want you to realize an inspiration in my absence that supersedes anything you've known before. This would mean that even if you were never to see my face again or receive another epistle from me, it will make no difference at all to your faith. I'll just read verse 13 as well. Discover God himself as your inexhaustible inner source. He ignites you with both the desire and energy that matches his own life. Your entire life is a poem. Any undercurrent murmuring or argumentative debating would be completely out of place. Do not let such issues disrupt the rhythm of your life conversation. Your flawless innocence radiates attraction as beacons of light in the midst of a people who have forgotten their true sonship and whose lives have become distorted and perverse. Your lives co-exhibit the logic of the message of life. You are, you are positioned like the stars in the night sky, superimposed and radiating like light, with shining, which, which shining pierces the darkness. Thus you confirm the day of the Lord and complete my joy. You are my wreath of honor and proof that I did not run my race in vain. I salute you, Brother Paul. He still wanted to go to Rome, remember, never got there. Not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. It was the last verse I translated of that translation at the time. You know that Paul is more present now in his message than what he could ever be in his person. That's why Jesus said it's to your advantage that I go. Because, I mean, if Jesus was just hanging around in a single individual human body, can you imagine? <laughs> you can't. Absolutely impossible. A single grain of wheat was on a mission to die in order to bring forth much fruit. Remember John chapter 12? The Greeks are here. They wanted to see Jesus. And they so fortunate they meet one of the disciples. Why would they want to come and see Jesus? Because they've heard rumors beyond in another land, in the Gentile world. <laughs> and this disciple says, every rumor you've heard, I have witnessed. Would you like to see Jesus? Just stand here under this palm tree, I'll be back. <laughs> and he's off and he finds another disciple. He says, the Greeks are here, they want to see Jesus. They run, they tell Jesus, the Greeks are here. Shall we just do a healing line? Because they've got to see confirmation of what they've heard. You know what Jesus says? The hour has come for the Son of Man. What was the big question? Matthew 16 verse 13. Who do people say that I the Son of Man am? What was the correct answer? The Son of Man is the Son of God. And upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. 
surname, out of the source of my identity, Simon, son of Jonah, allow me to introduce you to Petros. And upon this Petra, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against you. Those strongholds that has nations in captivity, in a pseudo captivity, a captivity that no longer exists, but they don't know. Minds blindfold Hades means Hades means Edo, not to see. Thank you, Jesus. I remember Lydia and I ministry in Poland. I think it was our first time in Poland. And um, we've been to Russia and Ukraine and, and, and Hungary and these countries with, with, with languages. I've been to Pakistan where you, you can't read anything on the billboards. You know, it's just you don't understand the language whatsoever. So we get into Poland that specific day and, and we just, in our first trip, and we just confronted with a complete different foreign to us place teeming with people. And um, none of the billboards made any sense until we turned the corner. And Colonel Sanders was sitting there <laughs> in a foreign land. He wasn't alive anymore. But his face was a presence in Poland. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my spirit. He says, you know what Colonel Sanders' secrets were? Two of them. The original recipe. And when he built the building, the emphasis was not on how many people in the community could either fit under one roof, but how many people in this community can feed out of my kitchen. It was so significant when we landed with Robert and Jean just after we landed and we walk into this, this house and just smell food. It's a kitchen. <laughs> and it was such a confirmation in my heart, you know, for, for what I witness in your ministry, brother, and in where your ministry is expanding to. Thank God for buildings. There will always be buildings. I mean, in the school of Tyrenus. Something happened there, and we have no clue how many people could be seated in the building, the, seat, the school of Tyrenus, but we do have a clue on the impact of the message that was proclaimed from that pulpit. Day by day, they were just being taught, and within two years, all of Asia heard the word, both Jews and Greeks. So it says something about the message. No wonder Paul could write, he says, I mean, the conclusion of this message is going far beyond anything that we could ever imagine. It's going fast. I mean, there's way beyond where we live in a time where we can just cross boundaries like that. Zoom conferencing, broadcasting, being in conversation with the people that may not even understand our language. But somewhere along the line, there's someone that hears and there's an igniting of the living epistle that speaks mother tongue language. Known and read by all y'all. <laughs> known and read by all. There's no limit to this conversation. And it's mission. Because as truly as I live, says the Lord. <laughs> what kind of power or dominion could possibly challenge the name that is above every other name? Far above. When Paul speaks about this in Ephesians 1, he's praying. He says that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened so that you may know the power that is at work within you. And we want to match power, all right? We want to measure it. So we've got horsepower, we've got candle power, you know, to try and relate to how many horses under that bonnet. And, and he comes, he says, according to the working of his might, when he raised Jesus from the dead, what happened in the resurrection? The resurrection generation was born. We were co-quickened, co-raised, co-seated we are in heavenly places. We're not on a journey there. We begin there. Yeah. We begin in the throne room. Yeah. 
Paul, Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, since then you've been raised together with Christ. Eng get your mind there. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities. Relocate yourselves mentally. If you can do it just like this, you, know, you can sit there and go dreaming about something. But our minds, imagine, captivated by throne room realities. Living from the throne room becomes the adventure of life. Realizing that soaring mode beats my fastest run, my best trying to walk it out. Soaring mode is our measure. So, the kitchen emphasis is certainly, let me just maybe do it on them. Lily asked me to read this little poem. It's just a little, not a little poem. It's such a powerful poem. Get your more parts up, you may darling, you say. It is a poem written by David Tenson. And um, it was written for this. He wrote it for the Christmas, I think, now, 2023. But it so touched me, you know. I read it and my heart was so overwhelmed. Let me just read it to you. It doesn't have the title here in the WhatsApp, but the title is Feeding God. His face pressed against her breast. So this is what he looks like. The one the prophet spoke of. The one the angel offered. Her eyes catch Joseph's gaze. Mary whispers, He looks like us. <laughs> Yahweh looks like us. His turned up nose now hunting for milk. With trembling fingers she does her best to flick open the mouth of God. Pulling his head in closer to her chest. Closer to her heart. In this way God receives his first meal. In a stranger's home. From the body of a teenage Galilean. Swallowing and slurping like a hungry lamb. The memory of every event leading up to this moment. Courses through her body. Tears of relief. Cross her olive cheeks. And fall upon her newborn. As Joseph now strokes her brow, she closes her eyes, looks up to the heavens, and catches herself giving thanks to God, who now lays in her arms. Emmanuel, God with us. Years ago, when we started with the Mirror Translation, with the Mirror Bible, I wrote as one of the introduction chapters. I've got it under understanding the Bible, but in the heading is the incarnation code. Because the incarnation code is what unlocks the image and likeness language in its most profound setting. In shadow language all along through the Old Testament. And then suddenly... The man Jesus Christ is unveiled. The greatest treasure. If you can you move my die poppy, bring us up, leave my angle. This is not. Not for good luck. <laughs> we bless Russia, the Lord. But it's a little doll that my granddaughter calls the reflection doll. And um, I use it because it best illustrates Peter's message in Second Peter chapter 1. Now, I love the King James's version as well of Second Peter chapter 1 because James speaks about 
Peter writing to those who have received a like precious faith. The Revised Standard Version, a faith of equal standing. You have received to begin with. We're not talking about a faith that we have to try and develop in time, you know, so that we can just wind up, wind up faith. And I remember Lydia's cousin was there. Um, we were there in, um, in Stellenbosch the day he, he broke the Africa record for high jump. Reinhard Schiel, Reini Schiel. And guess what? For 21 years, no athlete in Africa could match or beat Reini's record. And I often say to people, even the fact that I'm married to Reini's cousin did not improve my ability to jump any higher. <laughs> and so often we look at the faith of God, the faith unveiled. Jesus is God's statement of faith. <laughs> Everything that God believes to be true about you is on exhibit in Jesus. Because Jesus is God's mind made up about the human race. So he steps into our history, not so that we can have the convenience to, you know, of time, BC and AD, so that we can at least schedule today and schedule tomorrow and the, into the next year. The entire statement of faith is wrapped up in the man, Jesus Christ. So we have received a faith of equal standing. Where do we get that merit from? We know, as we mentioned, you know, in athletics, that's how you do it. You've got to just press harder and jump higher and, 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 and run faster and, and do better. And the records are broken year by year everywhere on this planet because of the striving of man to just, just, just gaining more recognition for what I can accomplish. And here we are confronted with the faith of equal standing, a like precious faith. Where do we get this from? How can we relate to this faith? He says, this rests entirely upon the merit of the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not what Adam got wrong. It's what God got right. It's what Jesus got right. That's the righteousness of God. We are brought into a standing. You know, if you, if you compare the word righteousness often translates um, to, to a, a scale of balances. You can imagine when, 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 when glory was lost. That's why in the Hebrew word kabot means the weight. Imagine taking the weight out of the scale on one side. It's now it's a perfect match. It's Genesis 1. Image likeness reflected. Invisible Elohim. Visible in Adam. In Eve. And suddenly glory is lost. The knowledge of glory is lost. And entire scale falls. And then Image and likeness is redeemed in the incarnate one. We're not gradually trying to add more weights, you know, to our best deeds. Let me just add more weights so that I eventually could just kind of somehow get into some kind of standing with God. We have just seen. <laughs> this thing is as global as you can imagine. There's enough gospel for the uttermost parts of the earth. And it's wrapped up. In the good of the good news. It's good because it's good. It's news because it already happened. <laughs> Our belief doesn't make something true. It's like once gold is discovered, it doesn't become more of the element that it already is. It just becomes currency. That's why we preach. <laughs> Multitudes have no clue. Be their clue. Living epistle. Be their clue. Right. I want to go faster. because I'm not even going to read the, the um, mirror commentary. That's a blessing. Or the rest of the verse. And now he says in verse 8. So Peter starts off with the fact that we have received a righteousness a faith of equal standing. And this faith is based on what Jesus achieved. So he says, God's desire is that we may now increasingly be overwhelmed with grace. Which is also translated as his divine influence within us. 
and become fully acquainted with the awareness of our oneness, the way he has always known us is realized in Jesus our Master. He says in the other translation, in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So whose knowledge are we speaking about? Their knowledge. We've made theology our guesses about God, and our interpretations and our defending, our doctrines, our debates. And suddenly we are overwhelmed with the peace of God that passes all understanding. <laughs> it embarrasses our best efforts to, you know, to kind of get our heads head straightened out. The peace of God uh, the, uh, that, that cancels everything that could possibly discredit us in our own understanding, in our knowing of ourselves according to our experience and encounters. That's why James writes about going away from where? From seeing the face of your birth as in a mirror. You immediately forget what manner of man you are. And we've made so much about the return journey that has become a deconstruction theology. I mean, it's going to take years and years and years. We finally not even get close to where you used to be. But you might just, if you can immediately forget, you might as well immediately remember. Because our association in the throne room carries no compromise with it. God's not sitting there, you know, and he's got a media operator. Say, oh, that guy, they failed a bit today. So let's just, you know. no, no, our, included, our inclusion in Christ, our co-seatedness, our co-seatedness, our communion as a fellowship. It's co-union, co-union. And the M in the ancient Hebrew is where the M comes from. It's just like waters, which in the understanding was just the, the engagement beyond the ocean. As you stare over the ocean, the heavens are right there. It's heavenly dimension in our co-union. Anyway, so here you go. Acquainted with the knowledge of God. The peace of God. The joy of the Lord. Is it wonderful to tap into their joy? Their knowledge? Why, why would God enter into Sabbath? Because Sabbath celebrates your perfection. Behold, it's all good. When contradictions come, we, we, we count it troubled times. He says, you can burst out in singing. Because you know something. What does joy know? It knows that the testing of my faith produces something that I cannot buy. You cannot even get hands laid on for steadfastness. Because it's an environment. We'll get to that. Oh, my Lord. I just want to get it into the context of little baby here. This is the outer shell, right? This is just the faith that we've received. Equal standing. Equal like preciousness because of his righteousness. And then verse 3 says, by his, yeah, by his divine engineering, he gifted us with all that it takes to live life to the full. Where our ordinary day-to-day -day lives mirror our devotion and romance with our maker. His intimate knowledge of us introduces us to ourselves again and elevates us to a position where his original intention is clearly perceived. And here he already uses the word that I translated, elevate. Because we'll get it in a minute. Verse 4, this is exactly what God has always had in mind for us. Every one of his abundant and priceless promises pointed to our restored participation in our godly origin. Everything, everything, I'm reading it again, that his priceless promises pointed to is our restored participation in our godly origin. This is his gift to us. In this fellowship we have escaped the distorted influence of the cosmic, the corrupt cosmic virus of greed. His image and likeness is redeemed in us. The default settings are restored. We are rebooted to fully participate in the life of our design. Sadly, in my mother tongue language, I mentioned the Afrikaans translation, many of the other translations. It's like putting the cart in front of the horses. He says, as you get... You, you, you get to become partakers of the divine nature after you've escaped the, the corruption. It's like going into the dark car rally with a little car that's not at all intended to go on anything but hard surfaces. And you land up there and you're going to attempt to do the dark car rally. And your prize would be a 4 by 4 
and we've preached that kind of nonsense. You know, I mean, you've, you've just got to get through it, brother. You just try harder. I mean, it's New Year resolution day, isn't it? It's like we're in that week. We're just going right in the beginning. And we've made up our minds, this year I'm going to do it. And willpower has failed us again and again and again. There are only two trees in the garden. Uh, Paul calls them two systems, two laws in, Deut- in Romans chapter 3 and verse 27. He says, what becomes of our boasting? In the context of what we have received, what becomes of our boasting? Now, this is a sensitive sentence because, I mean, in the Jewish culture, boasting had very much to do with how did you fare this week, you know? Uh, it'd be by, by, you know, next Sabbath, you know, Sabbath, you're going to be asked again, you know? And we, we, we grew up in a church, we had to sing every Sunday, read the Moses, Moses Law and in and, 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 and Dutch Reformed Church, and then we'd stand up and, and oh, it get to me as a child. I look at all these guys that are in their black suits with the white ties, you know, the, the, the eldership, and I, I said, they just sing the same sad song every single Sunday. Sunday. We have transgressed your law, oh God. We plead for mercy. I thought, these are intelligent people. Many of them are well known in the, in the community and they, they are learned people and, and they suddenly get into this mode when you walk into church and it's just, it's just sad to see that we've been stuck in a religion that lays emphasis. What an embarrassment to the gospel that, lay, that it tries to make sin consciousness a feature which it doesn't have in the context of the righteousness of God. When Paul says that faith comes from where? From the unveiling of the righteousness of God. We've translated a word. And we, uh, I remember back in Poland, I was preaching in a church. And um, the next morning, we got to this pastor's breakfast table. And he's sitting me in tears with his, with his interlinear Polish-Greek Bible. And I mentioned Romans 4.24 somewhere in the previous evening. Where Paul writes, you know, that um, uh, he was handed over. And then he uses the Greek word dia, which means because of. Because of our transgressions. He was raised. And again, the same word dia. Not so that we can be justified one day. Because of our righteousness. <laughs> and he said, this is, I've got to re-preach my gospel. This is, it just overwhelmed his heart. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, we've got the default settings restored. So then I just put a little summary here about the babushka doll. Now let's just read from verse 5. Now, in the light of what we are gifted with in Christ, the stage is set to display life's excellence. Explore the adventures of faith. Imagine the extreme dedication and focus of a conductor of music. Where would I get that word from? One of the first Greek words that just ignited my heart. Because I had such a problem with verse 5. I've just been told that we have received a faith of equal standing. I've just been told in verse 3 that he granted to us. Do you know what the word granted means? It means it puts reward language out of business. He grant, you cannot get this as a reward. He granted to us all things, all things that do what? That pertains to life and godliness. Everything that it takes to live life to the full is gifted to you. You can't reward, you, you can't gain it as a reward. You can't gain it as a, as a little, uh, you know, um, the, 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 a little gift, a, a little acknowledgement along the way. We granted with it to begin with. And now verse 5 got to me. I thought, now we've got to add, add to our faith. With all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge. And, to, and we've got to add things that, 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 that we thought we've got to just do this and do that and do the next thing. And then we finally get there, you know, some of us. Maybe, maybe, maybe just a just a very small portion of us will finally get, you know, to heaven one day because we, we, we thought that, you know, this, this rock is needed. Need anyway, Ooh. <laughs> Lord, the stage is set to display life's excellence. The word we've translated, add to, is a three-component Greek word. Epi, chore, geo. Epi is a preposition that indicates this situation. A teacher standing in front of a class, possibly. But epi has that position. Every, every Greek preposition has its own um, dynamic. And epi, and then the word chorus, where we get the word chorus from. 
choir, orchestra, a dance. I just got to the second word and I thought, add to. And I'm seeing the squire conductor. Because the next word is agu, to lead, as a shepherd leads his sheep. And we've witnessed several of Stefan's performances in Cape Town and then in Leipzig and in the Gewandhaus where our youngest son plays with a large orchestra. And then the conductor would step in. And he's not just someone that they quickly grab. They said, we need someone that can just hold this bat and kind of, do you have a good rhythm in you? you just, we just want to know, just get... The professor of music walks in. And when he sees your face, he hears your voice. He hears your instrument. And it's documented in the score. And there's a con contribution in the, in the orchestra that knows every subtlety, every nuance of music written some hundred years, a couple of hundred years back because someone heard the music. It was documented, not to gather dust somewhere in a shelf, but for its incarnation in sound. The stage is set. And you are the conductor of your own life. If we get there, we'll see there's another conductor involved here, you know it. But I'm just talking about you, individual you. It finds absolute context in the community of believers, the ecclesia, the ones who rediscover image and likeness birthed in us. So I've, re I've translated verse 5. Now, and I say in brackets just to keep the thread, in the light of what we are gifted with in Christ. The stage is set to display life's excellent. Explore the adventures of faith. Imagine the extreme dedication and focus of a conductor of music. How he would diligently acquaint himself or herself with every individual voice in the choir. As well as the contribution of every specific instrument. To follow the precise sound represented in every single note. In order to give maximum credit to the original composition. This is exactly what it means to exhibit the divine character. You are the choir conductor of your own life. Familiarize yourselves with every ingredient that faith unfolds. See how elevated you are. You see, it's not add to, to begin with. It's discover in. We've translated the word aireo, virtue. Areo means elevation. You cannot begin anywhere else with this. Because faith unveils you as co-elevated, co-seated, together with Christ in heavenly places. We don't end up there. We begin there. We're talking faith language. Remember Hebrews 11 says, by faith we understand that the heavens were made by the word of God. Faith eclipses our best, most uh, uh, brilliant academic minds. It takes us beyond our own understanding. The exceeding greatness of His glory. <laughs> that surpasses knowledge. Agape. It's length, it's breadth, it's depth, it's height. The dimensions of agape surpasses knowledge. We put the cart in front of the horses. So often. I remember Lydia had once a vision of athletes ready. It's in an Olympic context. I mean, these athletes are absolutely, they are waiting for this moment. They've trained for this moment. And it's ready, steady. And there's a double shot. What does that mean? False start. You might be running your best race ever. You're just out there. But you began wrong. And we heard in our spirits years back that there's a there's a double shot in most of our religious attempts. 
even in, in the evangelical world, in every Christian doctrinal definition. We've, we've got a false start going because we miss the point when we begin wrong. We begin at the finish. <laughs> so the very first dimension that faith reveals is our co-elevation. I had the pleasure once to fly with a microlite in Livingston. We met this guy at one of the churches that our ex teams started. I'm not going to go into all that story because that will take us a while. But so, so this guy was there with a friend from Botswana who... Who, 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 they were just sitting crying throughout the service because a friend from Botswana said the previous week he had this dream and he couldn't interpret his dream. He saw himself standing before his bathroom window, uh, um, mirror, mirror, and the face of Jesus was looking back at him. And it never, he, he was perplexed by this. He thought, this is so amazing. And he walked into our service in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Anyway, so his friend, the German guy, who escaped East Germany years back, you know, on a motorbike, and he came all the way through. Let us, I, I, I mean, okay, let me just take it short. So I, I've got this guy. He, he, he's so overwhelmed with, with, with the word that he says he'd like to, he would fly people. He had the most hours of anyone on, on um, microlites over the Victoria Falls. And he'd take us down into the gorge. And, and he took me up for, for, for I think, it's an hour or two hours. We, we just had a time. But I'll never forget that when we got airborne, I started crying. Because I saw a view that I couldn't imagine. You see the falls in their magnificence, this cloud, this thunderous cloud. And just to the side, there was a, a herd of elephants swimming through to an island. And I'm just trying to dry my eyes so I could just see. It was just so... The Holy Spirit said to me, Francois, geographically, you're still in exactly the same spot. But your elevation has changed. <laughs> so to begin here, I'll, I'll, the, the kids will enjoy, enjoy the dolls. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Okay, let me just go on here. I, I explain everything there, the, the word arete often translates, virtue comes from the word airo, to raise up, to elevate. Faith unfolds the secret of our joint elevation with Jesus. Verse 6, here you will realize your inner strength. Do you see there is more to you than what meets the eye? Image bearer, image bearer, it's not how old you are, how young you are, how little you are, how big you are. The mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is now revealed because it's now redeemed. We don't have to waste another day in the old mindset where we just can't get airborne. Co-elevated. A new kind of knowledge. It's a new kind of knowledge. It's not a knowledge that we can academically transmit. We can. We can do wonderful things academically. I do not underestimate that. Or, but I'm talking about the thing that faith unveils in our co-seatedness. We see differently. We see ourselves differently. We see our partners in, in relationship differently. We see our children differently. We see our world differently. What an exciting place. Here you will realize your inner strength just make sure that I've got it right here. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. The spirit, that's why I got it wrong. That I've, I've got it wrong. And it, it, it is this, the, the first is spiritual insight. Elevation. Yeah. I've got elevation. Uh, sorry, elevation. And then um, uh, uh, co-elevation, spiritual insight. Just seeing with a complete different... That's why Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding will be flooded with light. We can, we can do a message out of each one of these because there's just so much to ponder on. And here we discover that inner strength that we touched on just now, according to the working of his power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, to realize that there's a strength within me that outshines my muscle and my mind's ability to try and elevate myself, to try and get things done. It, it takes me to a dimension of knowing. And in that dimension of knowing, I discover a strength there. You know, it's not just knowing that kind of leaves me in this position where I'm not going, going any further with this, but in this place of strength. 
there is a launching of an amazing reality. Translated steadfastness. Stay in close proximity. Oh, I so wanted to touch on Acts 1. My time's done. Must I, must I land this? I, yeah. But go and read Acts 1 verse 4. It's on the app. Being insulted with them. He charged them. In, insulted. Not insulted. Insulted. We're talking about biltong. We, we make biltong like your jerky, but much better in South Africa. <laughs> and, and you've got your cuts ready. And it gets into a, into a um, container. And then it, the, the salt... It's left there and it's insulted. It's speaking about this insultedness. Um, uh, it charged him not to be separated at all from the immediate atmosphere in Jerusalem. They were to remain in close proximity for the promise of the Father which you heard from me. And let me just read verse 12 and I'm through with this. Uh, just verse 12. He says, They returned to Jerusalem from, Mount of, from the Mount of Olives which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. Sabbath day's journey is just more than half a mile, which served as a limit of travel on the Sabbath. The phrase became a common expression for a relatively short distance. Holy Spirit says to me when I was writing this, don't let your journey ever take you beyond the circumference of the proximity of my Sabbath rest. However far you travel in thought or circumstance, return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you in this place of, you see, this is a, the broody hen principle, steadfastness, creating an environment. It was my joy as a child growing up on, the, on our farm. My mother had turkeys and, and chickens, all free range. They were just running around. And it was my joy to go and look for the, for the nests. And you can immediately tell when a chicken is broody. Yeah, they, they, they just show it. You know, there's just a broodiness about them. And when you do find the nest, she's not going to say, Oh, you know, you want some eggs? Help yourself. No, she will make sure that you don't touch my eggs. Because her image is hidden in that shell. And she doesn't sit there in some kind of endurance, endurance marathon mindset. She's sitting there knowing. It's a beautiful translation that says, we are glowing from knowing. <laughs> She's just sitting there glowing from knowing. She doesn't have to count after a week and say, oh, nothing has changed. You know, everything seems exactly the same. Same egg, same size. Maybe I should just maybe I should just yield to temptation, go and run and look for food somewhere else there and do what the others do. There's a broodiness that captivates and it's close proximity language. It's returning to your rest. Doesn't matter where my travels take me, where my thoughts go and wander. Return to your rest of my soul. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And this is what it's what James speaks about. There's an engaging with what faith knows. That doesn't come with you know, just another message I've listened to. But it takes me into a place of engaging a steadfastness in the place of this strength and this knowledge and this co-elevation. And you know what happens there? A new kind of devotion. A new kind of devotion unfolds in the place of this embrace. And you know what new new kind of devotion reveals the new kind of devotion and worship unveils brotherly affection where I can worship and from time to time just have my eyes open and gaze at the ones around me. There's no longer, that person irritates me a bit, so I'm just going to go, Jesus, Lord, I love you. Lord. You know that James writes in James 3 verse 9, we can say the most beautiful things about God and then insult someone who's made in the image and likeness of God. James is not about what the person did to deserve the insult. 
It's about image and likeness. <laughs> and we say the same beautiful words in the disguise of someone's life that's perhaps not quite there in your understanding. But in the Father's they are. Celebrating them. And guess what? <laughs> even in Africa, when I take that last little one, even the next one, I've got the parents and the children equally engaged. <laughs> <laughs> Image bearers you are. But this entire teaching is ignited by the agape of God. Gee, God has no other agenda but agape. The kind that doesn't keep any record of wrong. The one that ignites faith. I spoke about the two laws. Boasting is excluded, says Paul. By which law? By which system? Only two systems. The system of performance? No, he says. The system of faith. So how does faith work? If performance works by willpower, do you know that your best choice, whether it's new year or old, your choice, to love him more is not going to beat who you already are by design. <laughs> Choices fail. Everyone. Ask Paul. The good that I want to do. And I'm, I'm speaking in Romans 7 verse 1. I'm speaking to you who know the law. You are acquainted with the law. He says, the good that I want to do, I fail to do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. I, I, who shall deliver me? And he says, thanks God. Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Eleutherias. So how does the law of faith work? Faith worketh by love. So I've quoted King James twice tonight. Like precious faith. And faith worketh by love. Paul writing to the Galatians. Galatians 6 verse 5. Faith worketh by love. That's how faith worketh. <laughs> it worketh no other way. <laughs> because love is ignited. Safest place you can be. Is to be in a place. Where you're loved. That's what makes your fellowship so precious. Thank you precious friends. Thank you for this amazing time. <laughs>